Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Rebecca Olson. I'm the executive director of the OEBC, as I hope most of you know. On behalf of our board, we want to thank E for these online events. And I think that today, uh, if you could stay on mute when you enter, please, that would be really helpful. Uh, I think today we have a number of guests. We have some non-members who were invited as well. Uh, if everyone can just stay on mute until we get through the presentations, we'll have time at the end uh, to go over questions and you can turn on your mics. So thank you for everyone who's a guest and a non-member of the OABC for coming. I'd like to inform everyone that this session today is going to be recorded so we can share it with all our members and, and you know, colleagues after the event's concluded. And before we get started and introduce our speakers, I thought I'd share just a little bit about the OABC. The OABC was founded in 2003 with a mission to help foster commercial development between the US and Oman. So that said, we also spend a lot of our time on our other mission, which is helping Omani companies and international companies meet each other, network, and do better business here in the Sultanate. We promote our members' uh, products and services to each other, and we make sure that all of our member executives stay in the know about new legislation, labor law like today, new companies opening, business opportunities in Oman and the US, and other trends or changes in the business environment. We also work really closely with the US Embassy on many of our initiatives and events, and we promote their work as well. OABC is also the official affiliate of the US Chamber of Commerce in Oman, and the US Chamber is a private sector organization, the largest business federation in the world, representing over 3 million businesses worldwide. So here in Oman, we have around 160 member companies, including around 36, who managed to join the business community of the OABC during the pandemic. Um, it's a bit surprising for some to hear about such an increase in memberships during such a challenging year, but what we, it seems to be that has to do with the level of activity and the personal connections that are still happening even amidst lockdowns and rumors and quarantines and regulations. So welcome to each of our new members who are here today and thank you for your participation in the OABC. Okay, so I've spoken long enough about our mission. We have a lot to cover in the next 45, 50 minutes, um, but please message me or the team if you're not a member and you'd like to learn more, or if you are a member and you wanna use more of your benefits um, for the annual membership. Without further ado, I'd like to thank today's members who were very willing when approached to speak today. I mean, Cheyenne, who's a speaker today, it was his idea, I think together with our team in the beginning, but when we approached our other presenters, they were very willing and they've spent a lot of time uh, preparing their remarks for today and the presentation. So thank you. And we're looking forward to hearing from you in a couple of minutes. All right, so next on our agenda, I would like to stop and thank the OABC premium members. This slide, if we were together, it goes up all the whole time. Every, you know, 30 seconds, the thing rotates by and I can give visibility and special appreciation to these companies who I fondly call our annual sponsors. We will just show this slide once today, right now, as a huge thank you to each of these companies for being committed, active members, uh, premium members of the OABC and for sponsoring our work at the highest possible level. So your support helps keep the OABC afloat uh, and hard at work, especially in challenging times like we're in now. And so now housekeeping, I already mentioned this, please do stay on mute. At the end, we will take all the questions. You can type them into the chat box or you can turn your video and your camera on and ask then at the end of the presentations, okay? Next and quickly, before introducing our speakers, I wanna mention a few upcoming events. The minute that our events can resume in person, we've been invited to join U.S. Ambassador Leslie So for dinner and a roundtable discussion at her residence. And we've also been invited to the Deputy Chief of Missions residence for our annual wonderful Taco Tuesday networking night. Uh, we are really ready for this as soon as the government lifts the ban on gatherings and we can do it safely and um, responsibly. We're also proud to announce this Exim Bank event for March 3rd. It is one you should not miss if you have any interest at all in importing U.S. products or services. The U.S. Exim Bank 
has a mandate and an ability to compete by offering loans that rival the rates in terms offered by China. Uh, they're very aggressively uh, wanting to finance uh, things that, you know, anyone who's importing from the U.S. Uh, there's extremely impressive opportunities for importers uh, who choose to buy American. So this is a very interesting event. And typically, we cannot record those sessions with government representatives. So please, if you cannot be there, you should send someone else. Uh, it will be a really beneficial webinar. And it's online as well because ban on gatherings and our speaker will be coming to us from DC. All right. You can also visit our website to learn all about our other events. Now, I would like to introduce our speakers who will present today. Um, and other members from these companies will also chime in later to support during the Q&A, okay? First, we have Mr. Cheyenne Sultan. Cheyenne is a director in Fragman's Dubai office. He provides strategic immigration advice for the Middle East and North Africa region, ensuring that clients' business strategies are aligned and compliant with immigration policies. Cheyenne assists leading corporations in the oil and gas, aerospace, pharmaceutical, healthcare, aviation, power, and transportation industries, and he has vast experience with regional immigration laws, especially here in Amman, and delivers immigration services to multinational corporations with a focus on immigration risk and compliance. Next, we have Ben Ewing. Ben heads up the CMS office in the Sultanate of Amman. His practice encompasses all aspects of labor law, manpower restructuring, commercial ventures, corporate activities and real estate, including the representation of public companies, government entities, and private investment funds. Ben has represented a wide variety of government entities, high net worth individuals, and private enterprises in relation to the ongoing management of their interests and assets across the MENA region. Ben has been based in the Middle East for over 12 years, working throughout the various jurisdictions of the GCC and the wider MENA region. Lastly, we have our two representatives from Qatar Airways, starting with Ajay Jacob, Regional Manager, GCC in Iran for Qatar Airways. Ajay was previously posted in Indonesia as well as Sri Lanka and Maldives as country manager in his long career with Qatar Airways for over 15 years. He will take any questions on their services and their product today at the end of the presentations. And for the presentation itself, we have Ranjan Sharma, marketing lead for Qatar Airways in Oman. Ranjan is a longtime member of the OABC and he's partnered on previous events with us during his eight years with Qatar Airways, before which he worked with Toyota Corporation and TVS. So we have a very diverse panel of presenters today, and we're very excited to hear from each one. It'll kind of uh, start out with Cheyenne. He'll introduce Ben, we'll introduce Ranjan, and we'll have the questions at the end. So once again, thank you all for your willingness to address our membership today. And Cheyenne, you are welcome to begin. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you everyone for joining today's uh, webinar. Uh, we will be providing information about the latest trends, the current uh, environment related to uh, labor policies, uh, immigration and travel, and some tips on how to plan for the future. Rebecca, next slide, please. Thank you. So starting with the trends, uh, the most prominent one is, uh, of course, the nationalization initiatives in Oman. Uh, uh, we have seen in the previous few years that initially there was some temporary uh, suspension of certain professions when it comes to hiring foreign nationals. Those temporary suspensions were extended again and again with the addition of certain industries as well. So we have seen this trend going along for a long time now. Even recently in the last uh, month in, in January, uh, there was a new announcement which uh, was stated that there will be new measures taken by the Omani government uh, in the coming weeks and months to further promote nationalization. So we clearly see that this trend will be there for a long term. The next one is the workers' right. Uh, in 2020, there was a removal of a no objection certificate, pretty much a permission uh, for from a current employer to move to a new employer. Uh, previously, either if you did not have a permission, you were required to stay uh, two years outside Oman before you can move. That was a good move from the Omani government giving the rights to the migrant workers in Oman. Recently, another move was to implement the wages protection system. And this is a very recent uh, 
um, um, announcement, and it is expected to be implemented actually within a week or so on February 28th, and, and by which uh, it will be required for companies to transfer salaries to this electronic system to ensure the salaries are being paid to the employees um, as per the employment contracts. Fees and penalties is, 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 is a new hot topic, I will say. Um, recently, they have increased the fee for certain professions, and there are in total 74 professions in, in eight different categories for which the standard fee, which was previously for a labor clearance application, around 300 umani real, which is, comes out to be around 700 to $800, has been increased for these 74 professions to uh, 50 $200. So this is like six to seven times, uh, you know, more than the previous standard fee for these uh, professions. Uh, it is a bold move uh, from the Omani government, considering the fact that companies are still right now struggling with the impact from uh, COVID. Uh, uh, but it was a, it's a necessity in regards to making sure uh, that, that, that hiring a foreign national gets expensive for foreign companies and they should choose for these professions where Omanis are available. They do have the skill sets to hire Omanis. Uh, penalties is, is another uh, trend that we are seeing which are being more and more uh, being applied to companies who are not compliant uh, with, the, with the regulations. And, uh, and basically there's more uh, site visits being conducted by the Ministry of Manpower uh, in order to issue these penalties to companies. Uh, lastly is the travel history and health checks. Uh, Pre-COVID, uh, there was travel history uh, requirements that employees had to uh, declare. And, and even that is so right now for Oman entry purposes, but we will see that trend going for a long term as well. Health checks were pretty much non-existence when it comes to uh, short term travels, right? Uh, but as we see as of today, it is pretty much mandatory uh, to, to enter uh, Oman and this will also stay for long term. So these are some of the trends that, that, that we do see will continue long term and the company should be prepared uh, for them. Next slide, please. Thank you. On this, I'm going to talk about, about the migration landscape and what is the current status? Um, so right now, the Omani government authorities like Ministry of Manpower, Royal Omani Police, they are operational. They are operating at a 50% capacity. So of course, there are some delays when it comes to timelines. Uh, they have been increased by one to two working days. So companies should plan in Oman of this extended timeline. Also, if there are any physical submissions uh, at these authorities because of social distancing, and the limited capacity at the offices itself, even those queues are pretty long, it takes much more longer time to process them. So these are some of the extended timelines from operational status of the government authorities that businesses should plan for. There are many visa pathways available for companies to avail. Uh, in mid-December or so, we saw all the visas, which were the long-term employment visa, short-term work visa, express visas, visas on arrivals, all of them being reactivated after the COVID period. So they are all are available except uh, from the uh, visit visas long-term for, for GCC and uh, residence permanent holders or certain nationalities like US, those are not available as of right now. But, but the rest of all the visas are available for out-of-country employees and they could be applied for. Entry and quarantine requirements are, uh, I mean, is, 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 is one topic which has been very fluid. I mean, uh, and then rightfully so, right? I mean, the, the status of, of increase or decrease of new COVID cases in varying countries have been changing. So accordingly, Oman has been changing the entry and quarantine requirements very frequently as well. As of right now, uh, seven days quarantine is mandatory. Uh, health insurance is required. Um, a bracelet has to be worn for tracking purposes and, 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 a, and a PCR test 72 hours before um, the arrival is required uh, as well. Travel restrictions have been removed to, 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 to primarily all the commercial flight flights are available. 
and 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 basically uh, there are no more travel restrictions from a flight perspective the land border on the other hand is still closed it's only omani citizens who can utilize the land border to enter or exit oman concessions has been evolving a lot and companies should be aware of them and and the reason is during the covid period there were a lot of concessions introduced uh, by the omani authorities um, for example, if an employee had an expired visa, he was outside the country, they can still renew it. But, but those concessions are not there anymore. And companies should not be relying on those concessions to achieve compliance. There are some new concessions which have been introduced. For example, the visa on arrival nationalities, which are 103 of them, instead of getting a 10-day stay in Oman, now they're getting 14 and also business travelers who are coming in on express visas, if they are here in Oman for 21 days, they can extend it for additional seven days. So there are some concessions, but companies do need to keep in mind that the prior concessions introduced during the COVID uh, you know, period in the peak, right? Those do not exist any longer. There has been a lot of focus on compliance recently. And, and with the, also the recent announcement where the Omani authorities give a deadline of 6th of January to comply with the work permit regulations. They, uh, they instructed the companies for having the job titles of existing employees moved uh, from omanized job title to non omanized job title before the 6th of January if they are currently working on a job title on the residence card which are omanized. So, so there has been a lot of movement from a compliance perspective and there is strict enforce, enforcement that we can see uh, coming in from December, January months. Next slide, please. Thank you. So before we get into the workforce deployment and harmonization, I just want to look at the demographics of Oman briefly, right? As per the latest data, it was 58% nationals, 42% expats, 14% youth unemployment and 31% median uh, age, right? 31 years. So as you can see, there's, I mean, there's, I mean, there is a population which is uh, uh, young and unemployed. So accordingly, there are a lot of initiatives by the Omani government. Of course, you cannot proceed with any work visa processing without getting a labor clearance. That is mandatory, right? And when it comes to the Omanization policies, right having a robust humanization plan to deploy workforce is very important because when you're planning for workforce deployment you need to obtain a labor clearance for that you do need a humanization plan and humanization plan includes not only the quantity of it like you have to of course meet certain percentage for certain industry and higher monies but also the quality what that means is that if you have existing money employees only, they need to be uh, you know, developing their skills during their time at your organization. They, they should be having career development. So the Ministry of Manpower does look at that a lot as well when giving approval for new labor clearances. The next one is the maintaining work-ready workforce. So of course, for deployment purposes, there has to be a workforce which has compliant standing, they are ready to be deployed. Accordingly, if there are new regulations or new deadlines, like I mentioned the one which has been recently announced in December, where you need to adjust the status of an employee from a humanized job title to a non humanized job title, those assessments should be conducted. And basically we should, uh, you, know, uh, you know, after doing the assessment ensure that those employees are compliant and they meet the eligibility criteria to be deployed at a customer site or a different uh, location. So workforce mobilization, uh, when we talk about it, changes to the immigration landscape is, is very important to consider. As we have just seen, and I mentioned so many new regulations are coming in uh, on a monthly basis, sometimes weekly basis. Uh, uh, these ones are coming in with per no, to no, to no prior notice. And immigration is getting uh, more layered and complex. So navigating through this complex landscape is very important 
for the company. So we recommend to mapping out these regulations, understanding what is the impact on the operations of the business, implementing any internal policies, and then also communicating to the right business key stakeholders uh, so they can plan operations accordingly and, and also manage the needs of their customers. Uh, management of existing employee population will be also key for workforce mobilization. And there has to be a focus on compliance uh, by which uh, I mean is that it is recommended to conduct an assessment for in the existing employee uh, population where they're located right now, what is their current immigration status, is that compliant or not? Because when it will come a time to mobilize them, that will be very important. Now, future of work has arrived early than expected, as we know, um, but there are still options for companies to, to basically ensure the workforce mobilization is achieved, right, during this uh, period. And uh, they can consider relocating employees in different entities within a month if that is a possibility, because a lot of the employees are now working from home. There's also a possibility to relocate them to a different country, like a country like UAE has introduced a remote working visa, right? So if there are any issues from a labor clearance perspective, that is also a possibility of getting remote working visas in different countries and relocating your workforce and, and ensuring that they are still working for the Oman entity. There are also different visa categories now which can be uh, available. Uh, as we know, the nature of work has changed. Um, you know, the uh, the face-to-face -face interaction has reduced. Uh, Long-term employment diplomas might not be required from a business operation standpoint. So there are other visa categories like express visa or short work visas, which are, which are for short-term work purposes that could be utilized, also reducing the impact of getting uh, labor clearance. And the last one is the deployment planning. Planning is critical in this current um, landscape of immigration. And we strongly recommend that, starting with the risk analysis. If you're planning on mobilizing an employee, one employee might be more suitable than the other employee to be mobilized in a certain location. So conducting that risk analysis on the basis of their nationality, departing country, the eligibility requirements, it will be key in regards to planning which group of employees should be deployed to which locations. Also balancing the timelines, which are currently extended ones with the competing business needs and managing expectations accordingly. Um, as I was mentioning, having a robust immigration plan is very important one of the key factor is having an harmonization plan as well, which takes us to the next slide. Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Rebecca. Um, as uh, people know, I'm Ben Ewing. My name. I'm the managing partner of CMS office uh, here in Muscat. Um, I'm currently joined by my colleagues Hassan Shad, who's a legal director who works alongside me, and Sarah Al Hanai who is an associate that works with me on the, the corporate commercial and the restructuring and labor and employment law issues. So today, what we thought we'd do is we'd, we'd give you an overview of a perspective. So whether you're a private company looking to do things with your, we restructure your workforce or to implement changes, or whether you're an employee who wants to know what your rights are vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your employer, uh, we thought we'd give you an overview of where the law in Amman currently stands and some highlights about kind of practice and things like that. So the first point is understanding the legal framework. So if I could go to the next slide, please. So many people um, under the operate under the impression that you can just go to one particular place in order to understand uh, the framework as it applies to you, either as an employee or as an employer. So they frequently flip to like the labor law and they expect to find the definitive answer there. But the reality is it's, it's more complicated than that. So in order to find the answer about what you can do with your workforce or what you can do vis-a-vis -vis your employer if you're an employee is you have to look at certain different things. So it's made up of the basic framework is prescribed for the private sector 
in, in the labor law. So the labor law was passed by Royal Decree number 35 in 2003. It's been amended several times since the introduction of the law. Um, it applies to all Amanis and expatriate workers um, that work in private establishments and organizations and their subsidiaries in Oman. So it's divided into 10 sections. Uh, the first section is the definitions and general provisions. Then it's the employment of nationals, regulation of foreign workers, contract of work covering things like wages, leaves, working hours, uh, and related uh, related issues. Employment of juveniles and uh, women, industrial safety, employment of workers in mines and quarries, labor disputes, labor unions, and uh, the General Federation for the Workers of the Sultan of Oman, and penalties for certain non-compliance with certain rules. So the late, if you're looking at the private sector, the labor law forms the basic framework over and above which you as an employer can contract and give additional benefits and rights to your employee, but that you can't deviate or go below the basic framework that's prescribed under the labor law. The other thing to bear in mind is that you are definitely talking about the private sector because some people come to us and they say, you know, I want to raise a case in the Ministry of Manpower, but you know, they, they actually work in the, for the government or in a semi-government company. And actually the applicable law is not the labor law for those employees, it's the civil services law. So that's the first thing that we address is to work out actually where that particular employee is working or whether where, where, where that company, where they operate and which law governs their restructuring, their labor law issues and things like that. Second of, um, sorry, third of all, there are ministerial decisions. So the Ministry of uh, Manpower and the Ministry of Labor frequently um, issues ministerial decisions which are binding and have the force of um, the force of law um, in, in Oman. So it's, it's, it's important to keep up to speed with uh, what those uh, ministerial decisions are. Then um, uh, there's the contract of employment. So this is the individual contract of employment that is issued to each individual employee. Now, people often make the mistake that there are sometimes two, two contracts of employment. One is the formal record of the employee, which is registered with the Ministry of Manpower, which is a basic form. And then normally there's a separate one which agrees additional benefits, rights and privileges with that individual employee. Now, like I say, Anything in that contract of employment which deviates or comes below the standard that's imposed by the law, the employee itself will be entitled to rely on the law instead to give him a more beneficial position. If it gives you additional rights, then you, that employee will typically be entitled to those additional rights over and above the prescribed minimum at law. So you have to balance the two together and make sure that the, the employee is receiving the rights that they're entitled to, both under the contract of employment and under the labor law. Then there's the um, HR manual. Um, so frequently uh, an employment agreement will refer to an HR manual and that's then deemed to be incorporated into uh, the contract. So as and when changes are made to the policy, if that policy has been approved by the Ministry of Manpower, those additional terms and conditions become binding on the employer. So it's important to look at those as well. Then there are things like internal communications which don't necessarily have the force of law, but if you've, as an employer, sent out uh, a notification to all of your workforce that they may be entitled to um, you know, a, a period of unpaid leave, uh, which is very relevant during COVID times, then that may well become binding if it ever a case ever goes, goes to court. And then finally, um, you've got the decisions of the, the Supreme Committee for COVID-19. So there's been three major kind of decisions of this Supreme Committee. It was formed to deal with uh, all sorts of issues to do with the pandemic. Um, they uh, first issued uh, a decision on the 14th of April 2020. They then issued a subsequent decision on uh, the 31st of December 2020 and then there's now the position of 2021 onwards now in 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 amongst all of these decisions what they what they've, they've come up with is certain certain rights of things that you can do so for instance you know back into to, uh, on the 14th of April um, all employees um, you know if you if you wanted to reduce the cost of your, your workforce the first stage was to um, you know make sure that employees use their their leave and then after that you know it was unpaid leave and then um, with regards to expatriate workers you could dismiss the expatriate workers provided that they received all of their legal entitlements so things like end of service gratuity uh, unpaid holiday untaken holiday um, uh, pay up until that point and then if the thinking is if that employee in question then 
went to the Ministry of Manpower or to the court system, they wouldn't be entitled to an additional payment for um, unfair dismissal during the COVID time, um, but they would still be entitled to their, their minimum legal rights. So it's important that as an employer, you're making the right decisions that comply with the law. And Subsequent changes have been introduced in, on the, the, the 31st of December and like I say from 2021 onwards, Cheyenne hi highlighted the, 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 the potential for you to second employees within your group, but also to other businesses. You can do that. Again, what we would emphasize from a practical perspective is that if you're seconding employees to another member of the group or to another entity, is that you document that in a uh, secondment agreement. Because as and when there are Ministry of Manpower inspections uh, at places, if they come around and they see that you're working in an office that doesn't marry up with your visa title, you need to have proof in order to uh, explain why that particular employee is there on site working for a different employer. Okay, um, next slide, if I could. Um, Omanization. So um, again, I'm sure I just uh, touched on this earlier. Um, as many of you know, Omanization um, is basically a, a government introduced policy uh, that came in in 1998, which is the goal of which is to replace foreign workers with trained uh, Amani nationals. Um, and certain quotas are set for certain industry sectors. And we get a lot of questions from clients about, you know, I, I'm, I operate in the oil and gas sector. What is my, what is my um, omanization percentage requirement? And the truth of the matter is, is that the, the, it, it's a matter of negotiation half the time with the Ministry of Manpower. So it depends on the precise area of the industry that you work in. It depends on the size of your office. It depends when you assess up. It depends on uh, how many current Armani employees you have. So for instance, if you've only recently set up, you're not expected to necessarily comply with that percentage right away, but you'll maybe given time in order to comply with that percentage over several years. But what you have to do in the interim is put in place an harmonization plan of how you intend to reach that percentage in two or three years time. Now, obviously, there's various different um, consequences of failing to meet that. So once you've reached your harmonization percentage, you've agreed one with the uh, Ministry of Manpower and you've reached that percentage, you get what's called like a green card, which allows you certain clearances um, and ease of uh, administering uh, visas for, for foreign nationals. So um, again, in January 2021, the Ministry of Labour issued um, updates regarding um, uh, job availability for Amanis in 2021. So um, just to give you a highlight of what they announced, they said that over 32,000 jobs, new jobs, will be available in, Mar in Amman uh, in 2021 for Amani nationals. 7,600 of those would be uh, in the government sector. So uh, the basic aim of this uh, policy is to, to boost employment opportunities for Omani nationals uh, in the private sector um, and will probably become in incorporated into future amendments to the, to the labour law. Uh, in addition, there'll be a new employment application system, which will replace the existing um, sponsor-tied clearance system and employment visa process. There'll also be a new lay mobile labour courts to deal with employment disputes. Um, there'll be an increase in the labour clearance fees for foreign workers, um, and uh, there'll be a fee reduction for uh, renewing existing ex expat uh, residence costs for companies that have have established Amani workforces. So again, it's a greater encouragement on having um, a higher degree of Amani employees working for you to ease the administration of, uh, of the visas. So um, moving on, um, the Ministry of Labour issued a ministerial decision on uh, eight, number eight of 2021 which uh, aims to regulate the practice of certain professions and activities based on the current labour laws. So the following activities are restricted for and reserved for Omanis only. So financial and administrative professions in insurance companies, selling, accounting, money exchange, management and arranging goods in operating stores in malls, accounts auditing professions in auto agencies and all professions related to selling and used vehicles in agencies. So um, we need to, as, as Cheyenne pointed out uh, again, um, we need to remember that this is changing on a very regular basis. New regulations are coming out all the time, new decisions are coming out all of the time, um, and um, we, it's important to keep up to speed with this. So if you've got any questions about what the latest law is saying with regards to your workforce, or if you're an employee and you want to know what you can do 
with your employer do you reach out to to us as a, as a law firm or, or someone else to get the most up-to-date information um, and ensure that you're on top of the top of the game okay next slide please Right, the uh, no objection certificate. Um, this is, we're getting a lot of interest from uh, clients on this. So recently um, they issued decision, ROP decision number 157 of 2020. This amended the, the previous uh, law, which was the implementing regulation of uh, foreign residence law, foreigners residence law, um, which kind of removes the requirement for expatriate employees to obtain an NOC from their existing employer in order to switch jobs uh, within a month. And as Cheyenne mentioned, the, that decision came into effect on the 1st of January 2021. So um, the previous um, law was that obviously you had to get an NOC from your previous employer um, before you were allowed to switch jobs within the month. If you didn't get that, then you had to leave the country for a period of two years before you were allowed to return and work for a different employer. So the new decision which came in from the ROP is that it, um, it which article one of which amends the article, previous article 24, it is now permissible for a foreigner to transfer from one employer to another, provided that the new employer has a license to recruit workers on condition that they pro provide proof of the end of the previous work contract or termination of it. So this is the point that I was highlighting earlier that the Ministry of Manpower might be getting confused. The Ministry of Manpower shouldn't be asking for NOCs, but what they may be asking for is proof of the termination or the expiry of the previous contract of the employee so that could even be something as simple as like a you know confirmation of receipt of all benefits at the end of that contract it may be an acknowledgement on a resignation letter or something like that but that is all that the Ministry of Manpower should be asking and if you're still encountering difficulties again go back to a law firm that may be able to help you and accompany with you to the Ministry of Manpower to explain the new requirements and how that goes so um, We've had a lot of feedback on this and the general kind of response on the NOC is that um, it's likely to have a positive impact on both employees and um, employees uh, and employees will have greater access to the hiring of expatriates, uh, expatriate employees with greater practical experience and things like that. It just provides a greater degree of uh, flexibility uh, and follows some of the some of the regional uh, developments as well. For instance, the UAE got rid of the NOC a while ago. Um, so in, in conclusion, I think you know it's 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 probably a good thing, and that's kind of the feedback that we're we're, we're encountering here, um, subject to the fact that people are still encountering a few difficulties. <laughs> okay, um, if I can move on to my last slide. Um, so, uh, what's important to note is that. Um, is to know your obligations as an employer vis-a-vis -vis your employees, particularly if you're getting rid of um, expatriate employees or you're uh, an employee who is being given notice of termination during this time. Um, while the visa, while, while you're on someone's visa, while you're on someone's sponsorship here, the um, employer uh, is responsible for providing um, either medical insurance cover or will cover your medical expenses while you're still on that visa. Um, and um, that's under Article 33. Um, and also under Article 56 of the Labour Law, uh, there's a requirement on the employer to repatriate the employee at the end of their particular contract. So um, there's no further details are given as to what that is, but that is normally specified in the contract of employment. So it's important to look at that as well. But that normally includes like reasonable relocation expenses back to the country and or a one-way flight back to uh, their country of origin. Um, so just important to recognize that whilst the visa is in place, those two obligations remain on the uh, remain on the employer. Um, so it's important to, to kind of get those um, uh, up to speed and uh, to make sure that you're fully on top of those. Um, finally, kind of just an overview of the current kind of like travel uh, restrictions and things. Amman is um, currently open to travelers from the GCC and an additional 103 countries around the world. The ROP announced that um, travelers from abroad uh, approved countries uh, do not require a visa for a 10 day time frame. Um, uh, however, in order to stay longer, you do need a you do need a visa if you plan to stay for a greater length of time than, than ten days. 
There are currently no curfews or restrictions on intercity or interstate travel within Oman, so you can move freely between the, the different governments. Um, international and commercial flights are currently operating, albeit at a reduced level. Um, so typically there's, I think, is around about two commercial flights per jurisdiction or per country per week, um, and it's not as many as it, there used to be before. For instance, I think Oman Air used to operate um, a couple of flights per day and Qatar Airways to, to back and forth to London, but I think that's now been restricted and moved back to uh, just two, two per week. Um, all passengers arriving in Amman are required to go um, through, to carry, sorry, international health insurance um, for the purpose of covering treatment for COVID for a period of at least uh, one month. Um, I recently have traveled back from the UK um, and I, I made sure that my insurance was in place and no one actually checked that, but it's except at the, the port of destination. So in London, they did check before I boarded the flight that I had insurance cover in place, but they didn't check once I, once I, once I reached uh, uh, Muscat, but that's just something to bear in mind. Um, GCC nationals and um, Amani nationals are exempt from that insurance requirement, obviously. Um, passengers typically must complete a pre-registration form before they travel. Uh, land borders here in Amman remain closed. Closed. Um, uh, travelers here are no longer, um, tourists are no longer permitted to stay for a period of less than eight days. This was done for the purpose of, uh, of a seven day quarantine period. Um, which obviously has the disadvantage for people that wanted to come here for, for business meetings. Um, all travellers are required to take a PCR test at least 72 days prior to travel. Also, they receive one once they re arrive here in Amman and they are required to do another one on the eighth day of the quarantine period if they want to uh, escape or like yeah, to go and do other things in Amman. Uh, if not, then the quarantine period gets extended to a period of 14 days. Um, foreign embassy diplomats are, are exempt from taking the PCR tests, um, but they are required to comply with the quarantine rules, the same as um, ordinary tourists or, or, or residents returning. Um, and again, travel laws are subject to change and they change on a regular basis. So it's just important to keep up to date with the latest requirements. And that's it that's from me. Perhaps I come over to Ranjan. Thank you so much. While we're pulling up this video, I have a quick question because I think now we can bring it up. Uh, has anyone had any experience with bringing in someone 60 or older? I'm thinking about uh, someone I know, their mom's coming. I'm looking to bring my parents. I heard 60 or older are exempt from, uh, I have to turn my video on, from this quarant the institutional quarantine. No one might know, just even anyone on the call. Um, and then if you bring in a person, to your home, does the whole household need to quarantine? Uh, this is actually important for companies because like, um, if you need to come into work, are you quarantining at home with that uh, new person in your household? Uh, so Rebecca, let me answer that one for you. I recently got my parents uh, to Oman from my native uh, Pakistan and um, they had to quarantine for uh, the seven mandatory days. There was no exception to that rule, yeah. And uh, now they're residents of Oman, so, I'm not sure if it would be different if they were just visiting Oman, but they had to quarantine, they had to wear a bracelet and uh, they had to get the COVID test on the eighth day after which the bracelet was removed and they were free to lead a normal life. Okay, so they quarantined in your home, not in the institutional quarantine. No, no, it wasn't an institutional quarantine. So this, this was uh, a month ago, That's... but now, you know, of course, uh, we all have to uh, put up in a hotel and, uh, you know, make sure we have the money to pay for the hotel as well. What I'm hearing, and we'll move on now, it's just kind of a pass the time. I heard sure. kids and over 60 and people with health conditions can skip the institutional quarantine, Diane is nodding, and they can head home. Uh, but I don't know what that actually looks like then. If you're allowed to skip the institutional quarantine and you quarantine at home because you're over 60, does your family need to quarantine? We can come back to it later on. All right, let's thank you, Ben. That was extremely helpful. Uh, and we'll hand it over to Ranjan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hope everyone is doing good. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Cheyenne, for that uh, uh, detailed presentation on immigration and labor laws and policies. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, OABC team, Rebecca, Leanne, Najla, and every uh, other 
a member of OABC who has been involved in putting this uh, webinar uh, together. And I'd also like to thank you again that for giving us this opportunity to uh, present ourselves. Well, I would like to keep this brief and short. Well, as you, we all are aware that uh, last year has been very tough for all of us, especially the travel sector. And being an airline, it has been uh, a really challenging year for us. But um, I can very proudly say that Qatar Airways has tried to mitigate. We have tried to innovate. And uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, we um, keep no soon under in making families, friends, relatives, and every uh, loved one uh, see each other and meet each other. Uh, moving forward, uh, next slide, please. Thank, Thank you. Uh, yeah, so. Uh, as demonstrated, we have been the pioneers in uh, uh, detailing safety in our aircrafts uh, in air and on board. You'll be glad to know that we have just a very few five to two positive, positive cases from the passengers who have flown with us. We have operated almost approximately more than 40,000 flights since the pandemic began. And all our crew, very handful of our crew who got infected. But since the May 2020, when we started and uh, we introduced uh, full PPE kits, we haven't had any infection in our uh, operating crew as well. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. We have operated for more, over more than 470 charter flights all across the globe from different regions, different continents. And we take pride in saying that uh, we, during the uh, pandemic last year, whole last year when no one was flying, we were making sure that we follow all this uh, preventive and um, uh, security measures and make sure that we make people meet. So uh, as you can see from the map, we have uh, from our charter planes and from the normal passenger flights, we have almost covered more than 470 charter flights. Uh, there were a couple of them from Oman as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, and with that, we also introduced a lot of flexibility uh, for our passengers and loyal customers that they can uh, change their tickets to a later date. We introduced unlimited date changes, a flexible ticketing. We are giving queue miles, uh, various refund options, and also unlimited destination changes. These policies keep on updating. So if anyone of you, you or your passengers have booked or are trying to book, they can go through our uh, terms and conditions tab where uh, these policies keep on changing. So we have tried to mitigate as much as we could that no one should suffer if the plans are being canceled, postponed, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, and as demonstrated before, we have set a new standard for safety amongst uh, our all uh, channels, whether it's uh, in ground or in air, right from mobile or robotic disinfection areas to uh, luggage screening, protective kits, uh, uh, first in industry, uh, Honeywell's ultra-voting cabin system. We have made sure that if you're traveling with us, uh, we want to make sure that you reach your destination safely and uh, uh, without any uh, uh, infections or without any uh, uh, discomfort. Next, please. Can we play this uh, video? Small video. <laughs> Welcome to Doha, from every one of us, even those working quietly behind the scenes, so you can relax and enjoy the perfect break in your journey. is done. Qatar Airways, welcome to our home. Uh, with that, we also uh, would like to highlight here that as we know, uh, with the eight, most of the airlines have grounded their A380s and their restricting operations. We too uh, uh, have uh, limited our A380 operations, but we take uh, a lot of pride in uh, telling everyone that uh, Qatar Airways is one of the largest, op is operating one of the largest fleets of A350, which is the more sustainable, more greener choice. As we all know, we love our uh, planet and our climate, 
Uh, hence, uh, the, uh, A350s are, uh, are, are Qatar Airways um, uh, a pioneer aircraft, and uh, we hope that uh, we would like to uh, give the world our bit of having a more sustainable future. Next slide, please. Uh, we are the first global airline in the world to achieve a five-star COVID-19 rating by Skytrax, as uh, explained before, that from um, right from the time you board the aircraft at the airport and uh, at all our um, touch points, we have maintained our security uh, practices, security and safety practices. Next slide, please. You'd also be glad to know that we're the first airline who's who's been uh, testing the IATA Travel Pass, uh, which is a digital uh, passport as mobile app. We are still in the trial and uh, testing stages, and uh, this is still under uh, the the pass is still under pro progress. As in, when we receive that it is uh, good to go, this should be implemented in near future. Next slide, please. Uh, last week, Qatar Airways also became the first airline to introduce a zero-touch flight entertainment. That means uh, you can see or watch your favorite television shows, movies, uh, dramas, and any kind of um, media content just by a click of your phone. So you do not have to touch on board screens. You do not have to uh, uh, touch anywhere else, but through your phone, you can just see, seamlessly connect and watch all your TV shows and programs uh, at ease. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, this question was, uh, I thought I'll just put it up here. So uh, in for the country like Oman, as you all know, the Supreme Committee or the, uh, or the Ministry of Interior, which uh, normally formulates all the laws and guidelines regarding air travel, uh, travel across border, um, that means your land, air, or uh, sea border. So uh, Supreme Committee uh, in turn uh, gives all the direction to Civil Aviation Authority. And the Civil Aviation Authority is the supremo of all the airlines operating in and out of Oman, and in turn, they uh, give their uh, directions for the country to all the other airlines, whether it's us, whether it's Qatar Airways, or Turkish, or Iran, or uh, all other airlines. So yes, so Civil Aviation Authority is the one who then passes all the information to all the other airlines. Next slide. These are the few, uh, these are a few links which I have uh, mentioned here, which can be uh, pass it on to you all uh, to be shared later that uh, all the uh, passenger information, travel alerts, entry requirements regarding PCR labs, you can just um, um, click here and you can save this for later so that uh, whenever you or your friends want to travel, they can check on these hyperlinks on these URLs and get the most updated information from the airline. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's it for my end. And um, uh, you'll be glad to know that last year we launched seven new destinations. Uh, to name a few, uh, we started uh, Seattle in January. We are launching Atlanta soon. And uh, there are a few more in the uh, pipeline. So we're looking forward to, uh, to 2021 uh, so that we can all go back to normal and uh, make skies um, safe again for travel. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjan. I already have a question for you that someone messaged me in the chat. Um, before we close and open it to more questions, are your flight and cabin crew considered frontline workers? Will you be all vaccinated soon? Like um, it says Etihad or another airline has done this. Um, are you planning on the same? Uh, well, currently as we speak, yes, there is there is a vaccination uh, drive going on in uh, Qatar as well. But uh, at this point in time, I do not have the exact numbers of or exact data as to uh, how many of our operational crew have, have been vaccinated. But last time I heard was, yes, there is, uh, uh, there is a, a, a plan in which uh, they uh, uh, are uh, trying to get every operational crew vaccinated. Excellent. Okay, everyone, I need, what I need to do is say thank you to everyone and tell people that they can go. It's, our time is up, it's been an hour, but we are gonna continue if anyone has questions. But first of all, if you need to leave, the event is, I guess at this point, finished. And a special thanks to all of our presenters today. I know uh, you prepared heavily and did a great job presenting and we will be sending out this recording so you can share it uh, with your own contacts and we can put it on LinkedIn and everything. But if any members have questions, you're welcome to use the chat box and you're welcome to just turn on your video or, or your sound now for any of our speakers. Rebecca, can I ask a question, please? Of course. 
Yeah, um, Ben, uh, this question is to Ben. My name is Abraham again. Uh, just to touch on that point, which you stated about the employment application systems. Uh, you said that was going to change from the sponsor. Uh, if you could lend some clarity to that, please. Yeah, well, we don't know the details, so I'd love to add some clarity on it. But unfortunately, I don't think we know uh, e exactly, but it's going to be more of like an online uh, system um, and less kind of like administrative uh, paperwork. Um, perhaps we can talk about this offline as and when we, we have further details. But at the moment, we don't we don't know how that is going to take effect other than that it's just an initiative that's been uh, been put forward. When would this be introduced? Do they have have they given a timeline or indicated something? I think I, I think it's meant to be April of this year, but um, I, 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 again, I don't know because some of these timelines. I mean, it's the same thing with VAT that was meant to be introduced like several years ago, and it's it's now only just coming into effect in April. So, um, I, I, I have, I've tentatively assumed it will be April of this year, but that that timeline may slip a little bit. We'll, we'll be putting out a law now as and when that, that system goes live and as and when we have details, we have like an online um, uh, publication of articles and we normally share those articles with uh, OABC. So either keep an eye on the OABC website or to the CMS Law Now website and we'll publish further details about that employment system as and when that goes live. Very good. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. No worries. I have another question here from one of our members. Junaid is asking, will an employee be able to join a new company if he resigns from the current workplace before the contract period ends? Yeah, um, perhaps I'll answer that. Um, provided that that resignation is accepted, because if it's like for a fixed term contract, the employer, the current existing employer, may not want them to uh, be released, and there may be sort of like claims, legal claims, vice versa. Um, so, but if if the current employer accepts the resignation and releases the employee, then you're technically you're free to you're free to go. On the resignation letter, if you're if you're resigning, what I would suggest is that you just put a the, uh, the bottom an acknowledgement by the current employer so that you've got their signature on the fact that they've accepted that and that can be used as evidence in front of the Ministry of Manpower to say my employer has accepted my resignation, my current contract is finished, I'm then for allowed to transfer to this new employer. Thank you. Are there any other questions from our members or guests? Okay, I think that that's it. Thank you, everyone. This has been really useful, very different types of presentations, but gives us an idea of what's going on. And like you all said, I think separately, things change every day or every week now. So stay tuned. Thanks as well. I know, um, especially CMS, we put out your, uh, for the whole team, your insights before in our weekly newsletter. So do open those if you're a member. Um, when there's a new article or an insight from our law firms, we tend to take those out on Wednesday. Um, keeps you updated and it's really useful information. So thanks everyone. I guess we'll see you at the Exim Bank event unless things change and we can meet face to face and have a lovely evening, everybody. <laughs>